to the all new adventures of the doctor who book club podcast this is matt in minnesota and chris in south london chris hello how's it going life is well here in the northern hemisphere it's getting colder yeah yeah time times are good the weather uh kind of calls for a, a nice circumnavigating trip around the globe i think to uh <laughs> <laughs> to a tropical destination Yes, yes, let's all go to the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, more on that later. Yes. Do you uh, have something for show and tell this month? I, I do, I do. And actually, we'll be uh, staying in the Southern Hemisphere. I recently discovered a, um, a sort of a brand new podcast uh, called Doctor Who and the Episodes of Death, uh, which is a, a, a podcast run um, by an Aussie couple. Uh, and uh, they talk about Doctor Who episodes or stories that fan wisdom is not kind to. Uh, and they have a kind of a different guest on for each episode. Uh, and for the uh, the first episode, they've done Terror of the Vervoids. Uh, so because they thought they would do one of the least popular stories, one of the least popular doctors and one of the least popular seasons. <laughs> uh, and uh, and it's it's kind of a spin-off of um, the excellent uh, Australian podcast Splendid Chaps that I don't think really kind of got that much attention, certainly in the Northern Hemisphere. But in the 50th anniversary uh, year, there was an episode every month about the different doctors. Uh, and it was kind of done in front of a live audience in Melbourne. Uh, and this kind of like the term Splendid Chaps is a reference to uh, the Brigadier's line in, is it the Five Doctors, where it says Splendid Chaps, all of them? They are brilliant shows. Uh, and so they every now and again have uh, sort of like extra episodes, like they've recently done one about the Sarah Jane adventures. When I say recently, they did it in May. Uh, but And they occasionally have... Um, uh, Tansy from uh, the Verities as uh, as a guest. Uh, so uh, yeah, my show and tell is uh, kind of like splendid chaps and its uh, and its spin-offs because uh, uh, I don't think that they've kind of got enough uh, attention. Um, certainly, I've I've rarely heard other podcasts mentioning them, which is when you'll probably say, "Oh yes, I knew about them since in in the anniversary year," and everybody was talking about them, Chris. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's wonderful, wonderful stuff, and very funny. Yeah, it's slightly irreverent, kind of. So uh, yeah, yeah, it's good. Thank you. It's good. Keep warm. Yes. Indeed, indeed. You you know it. I know, okay. I know it very well. Yes. Uh, <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. As you as you surmised, I listened to it throughout the the fiftieth year, and uh, yeah, it wasn't quite Kickstarter. I think it might have been like an Indiegogo campaign, but they did a uh, like a fundraiser. So I have a, a Splendid Chaps T shirt, which I mm. often wear to uh, conventions here stateside. So oh, yeah, it's a it's a great podcast, and uh, the group behind it they also did a uh, Australian uh, TV series which was based on a uh, LGBT uh, science fiction club that lasted for uh, one season. Okay. Doctor Who has featured prominently. Well, they did a radio series called Night Terrors. And Jane Badler guest starred in that from uh, V, I remember. Yes, yes. I am a friend of a friend of Ben uh, from Splendid Chaps. Mm. Um, uh, but I have never met him. Nor have I actually ever physically met the friend who we share a friend with. <laughs> but, uh, yes. Yeah. So it was an ABC uh, mm. ABC One uh, television series called Outland, okay. uh, and it lasted for a season. But yeah, Splendid Chaps is a uh, is a great show, and as is uh, like you mentioned, Night Terrors, they're kind of comedic. Mm. Uh, you can tell that they love Doctor Who. 
a few of the hosts guest starred on there was an after show that aired after every episode of series 10 in mm-hmm. australia called the whovians and yes. uh, i think they guest starred on on that series as well yes yeah it was uh, I, I i have some friends in australia media circles who have told me that um, that that the job they had in mind for me has been taken. <laughs> I thought, there is no way that I'm going to move to Australia and present a prime time-ish program of Doctor Who. So my show and tell for this month, mm. a collection of Time Lord verse. It's Aha! the uh, Now We Are 600 book by James Goss, illustrated by Russell T. Davies. It's just a really delightful short. It's only like 100 pages or so, but it's lavishly illustrated by RTD. It's got pictures on every page, and it's just a fun collection of poems. It's based on um, Now We Are Six by uh, A.A. Milne, creator of uh, Winnie the Pooh. Now We Are Six isn't as well known in the States, so every poem it'll say like, in the style of, and it'll reference, you know, what poem it's kind of an adaptation of. Yeah. It's a wonderful little book, and uh, I recommend it. So that's my uh, show and tell. It's certainly, I mean, it's created quite a buzz over here um, in in fandom circles. Uh, but uh, yeah, because uh, there was a signing at one of the the major bookstores in London. Um, alas, on my wedding anniversary, so I kind of thought I'd probably not likely be able to go. <laughs> uh, so I didn't bother trying to get a ticket. Uh, and uh, I, I gather as well that uh, it's kind of featured a picture of a female doctor yes yeah but obviously rtd probably had an inkling i mean maybe it's not quite so obvious from it that it's jodie whittaker looks kind of like her it's it's oh really yeah okay not enough to where someone who's like who got an advanced copy would be able to say i know who's playing the doctor but yeah Yeah. you can kind of tell that he may have had a heads up as to who was cast Mm. which is kind of cool yeah i guess he's done a lot of um interviews and podcasts uh, in the last month or so related to this. So he's been in the news again a few different times. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would imagine, you know, Stephen Moffat would take some time away, but it'd be nice if mm-hmm. maybe after the Chibnall era is over that, you know, if, if Moffat came back with something similar. I think it's one of those things where the the current showrunner really stays in the background when the next showrunner comes along mm-hmm. and, and then maybe steps out of the shadows uh, later on, perhaps. Or maybe yeah. I'm just reading into it way too much. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's it's a sensible thing to do. Um, yeah, to kind of you know to sort of step back and stuff. I mean, uh, unless your success is doing a particularly terrible job, but uh, and I'm sure the chip and I won't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, Moffat's a very busy fella anyway. He's got so I'm sure plenty of other things that he he'll be kind of doing. Like maybe a fifth season of Sherlock. Who knows? It would be nice if he did a follow up to uh, the Tintin movie. I don't know if they're ever going to do that again, but. That'd be fun. Yeah, I, I think the moment might have passed, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Cool. Right. So, so this month we're reading Eye of Heaven by Jim Mortimer. Yeah, yeah. And, and speaking of Tintin, this is kind of because like, Tintin used to have globe trotting adventures, and uh, this is a bit of a globe trotting adventure. So, Jim Mortimer. So uh, he started out in the New Adventures. He co-wrote um, with Andy Lane Lucifer Rising, if I remember correctly. And he, yeah, he he he, he tends to do sort of books with, shall we say, quite a bit of death in them, and also books that are sort of tend to be fairly intense as well. Uh, so uh, yeah, we, we shall we shall see whether whether that's the case with uh, with this one. Um, and he also kind of abruptly stopped uh, the uh, BBC books with a little bit of a kind of a falling out on editorial interference, from what I understand, and uh, published. Uh, I think it's campaign, isn't it? Uh, his uh, his kind of missing f- <laughs> first Doctor novel. Mm-hmm. So, uh, which which I've, I've I've never read, but because uh, I, I understand, did he want to write it in in the form of like a poem? Yeah, or something I, like that. Yeah, I have it sitting on my shelf, but I've never read it either. Mm. Yeah, I yeah, I'm not sure whether it's how it's written, but mm. I so was I of heaven. Was this the last novel he wrote? Because I know he's written a couple of times for some of the big finish short story collections. But I'm wondering if he wrote anything after this one or not. Uh, so he wrote Bell Tempest uh, in the Eighth Doctor range, uh, which might have been published after this. And I am struggling to think of uh, of any other 
books that he threw. Suddenly he bowed out of the BBC range relatively early. Mm. Uh, so, and I don't recall him writing any other H. Doctor novels. He did write, was it The Natural History of Fear, I think, for um, for the audios um, for the Eighth Doctor. He's done a lot of sound design and music composition for Big Finish too, I think. Yeah, well, he was a DJ. Oh. Uh, and uh, so apparently sort of, you know, sort of relatively well known in the Bristol kind of club scene of the of the 90s uh, so it, yeah a very interesting chat because I mean he kind of yeah he, he in some ways sort of at a time when Doctor Who was regarded as being very geeky uh, I always thought it was quite cool that we had this guy who was basically a club DJ who in his spare time <laughs> uh, would, would trot out often these very dark uh, Doctor Who novel. People could uh, make that mistake of John Peel, but they're two separate people. <laughs> yes, they are. Uh, so, uh, yes. Uh, one of them was a far better writer than the other. Uh, alas, the better writer didn't write for Doctor Who. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the setting and structure. Mm, the structure, yeah. yes. So this is one of the earlier past Doctor adventures. It features the fourth Doctor and Leela, as we talked about. And it's set between... The Talons of Wang Chiang and the Horror of Fang Rock. So this would be brown-eyed and not blue-eyed Leela. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You said about structure. Probably fair to say that uh, this book is not exactly structured in a linear way. Mm. Uh, to an extent that I have done my notes in a spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so to kind of keep track of everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if we really need to go into the chapter and organizational structure for every book, but yeah. but then we get to a novel like this, and I, I kind of think like, you know, it, it's pretty cool that we take a moment to to do that mm. because here it, it's essential. Yeah, this book is told in two parts, and it's <laughs> a nonlinear story structure, and every chapter is told in first person with. Uh, mm shifting narrators for each chapter most of the chapters are, are going to be from uh leela's point of view mm -hmm. and you could almost think of this as um two coins and two sides of a coin one for part one and one for part two mm. and each chapter kind of flips back and forth between the two the even number chapters kind of all flow together and then the odd number chapters flow together and then mostly yeah mostly <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there, there's, there's one chapter where it's uh, a little confusing. <laughs> yes. All right. Okay. So. So with all of those health warnings, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> shall we begin? We start with a prologue, uh, which is set on Easter Island in October of uh, 1842. Mm -hmm. And... So the, the prologue is 30 years in the past from where the, the main story takes place, which is in 1872. And mm -hmm. then the epilogue is 30 years on from that in mm -hmm. 1902. So it's from the, this prologue is from the perspective of uh, Horace Stockwood, who's a, uh, at the time he's writing the prologue, he's a younger uh, man who mm -hmm. had traveled to uh, Easter Island with Alex Richards, who was his uh, kind of lifelong friend, and they are on the island and meet the uh, the native people on the island and mm -hmm. kind of befriend them, and they um, end up stealing part of the Rongo Rongo. It's a wooden tablet. Um, yeah. The the back of the the novel gets that wrong. They call it a stone tablet, but mm -hmm. it's a it's a wooden tablet with inscriptions on it, which they steal, and uh, as they're kind of making their way back to the ship, the natives uh, on the island discover that the Rongo Rongo is missing mm -hmm. and uh, start coming after them. He's managed to kind of somehow get free. He's sort of, um, but he stumbles across a ritual where, because they have like a local guide called uh, Totoro, uh, and uh, they see him being kind of like sort of sacrificed, sacrificed slash punished. And then um, sort of he sees... Uh, his his mate Alex being brought out and uh, and basically the narrator now kind of runs uh, and sort of finds his way out into the sea uh, and sort of gets onto the boat but uh, the uh, the natives are still kind of pursuing him by boat but you can see that all along uh, the island uh, the um, the the Maui which uh, is the, the the kind of the statues from Easter Island uh, seem to be watching. Uh, 
and sort of almost look as if they've been moving um, a little bit like the ogre from Sense of Blood, uh, <laughs> <laughs> of which more later. Yeah, so uh, we are off to, uh, I think, fair to say, a fairly vivid start to proceedings. Mm -hmm. So now are we going to go chapter by chapter? Do you want to do it that way? or I think that's probably the best way, um, I think, because, yeah, I don't know. I can I can sort these things so that um, so that we can kind of go in in chronological order. But I mean, there are certainly there, there are some times where kind of people are introduced in chapters. They're introduced to the reader, but so obviously the narrator has known them from early scenes mm -hmm. <laughs> and such like. I think sometimes you have to give the flavor of what it's actually like to read the book. Mm. So I don't know. What's your thoughts? Yeah, I think going uh, chapter by chapter is fine. I think I might just mm. say that the odd number chapters are mm. later on in the journey. Yeah, The even numbered ones start in london and they really mm. concern like funding an expedition you know back yes. to easter island and then yes. the the odd number chapters kind of describe the journey from portsmouth to easter island and yes they, and they go the long way around so there's no panama canal yet or anything so no, they, no. And, and they're not even going around the cape of south uh south america how do they go around? They, they, well they, they do a kind of like a slingshot right anyway around australia but uh, but yes, yeah, I can't quite remember the exact bits of the route, but uh, it, it's a long way. Yeah. Uh, so but also, I think it's probably fair to say that if the uh, and we're kind of skipping ahead here a little bit, but this is a non-linear book, so hey, I, I do think that certainly the structure helps this bit of the book because if you just had a lot of stuff about sort of like the sea journey on its own, I don't know necessarily whether it'd be quite as gripping. But we'll mm. we'll, we'll come to that later. <laughs> so. Chapter one is, uh, hmm. it starts with Leela's point of view. So we've shifted uh, perspective and we're, to, it's fair to say we're inside Leela's head for much of this book. Yes. There's a couple of chapters that shift point of view to um, narrators that we don't usually see. Um, we'll get to that in, in, a, in, a, in a moment. But <laughs> um, it starts with Leela catching flying fish on the Tweed, which is a boat that the doctor has purchased. And when we mean, hmm. when we say purchased, he... He didn't charter the boat. He bought it outright with a <laughs> sack of gold coins. Yes. Probably from yeah. the TARDIS. Oh, no, we find out about those gold coins later. But, oh. Uh, yes. But yeah, so Leela's catching flying fish. And we meet uh, a James Royston who uh, gives Leela a metal ball that apparently um, someone tried to kill her with uh, before the journey started. Uh, she kind of goes off on one sort of saying that uh, she feels as if the because the metal had been inside her, that it knows her. Uh, so, yeah, we have a lot of her, as you were saying, a lot of from her viewpoints, sort of particularly her beliefs, sort of beliefs of very much like, an, an, and sort of like people's personal religions are very much like a theme in this novel. Mm. It's very much a novel with themes, I would say. And we also encounter Horace Stockwood again, so the gentleman from the prologue, uh, who uh, fair say has a bit of an avuncular relationship to Leela, uh, and uh, sort of like Leela refers to him as uh, her best friend, mm. and you're like, oh okay, well this is a bit strange. And uh, Leela's also measuring time in terms of nine days instead of weeks, uh, which uh, I don't know whether that was something from Face of Evil. And she also makes reference to the land of Eng instead of England, uh, and she describes the boat as being a village. Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah, her her prose is quite characterful. But one thing I'm wondering is when is Leela writing this? <laughs> is it when she's on Gallifrey? I didn't take it so much as people actually writing this down, like as as log <laughs> entries, because it's there's I don't know, there's just too much too many details, and yeah, it's it's really just kind of, to me it's like first person. Um, it's not first person omniscient, but it's uh, it I, th I think the references to uh, to nine days, I think that help at least it helped me as the POV kept shifting between characters each chapter, it helped mm. me kind of quickly okay, say, okay, we're back in Leela's head now because we're, we're talking about yeah. weird descriptions for everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so if it gets odd, it's Leela. Yeah. Um, apart from, she has spot-on descriptions for the various ship terms. So she knows where the forecastle is uh, and various other things. I'm like, wow, okay. She, she studied nautical terminology. <laughs> uh, she just gets confused by horses and the like. Uh, again, of which more later. Mm. So and we, we now switch on chapter two it's in london and so we see horace stockwood in his home and he's basically recapping to the doctor and leela the prologue 
One thing that we never quite learn is how the Doctor finds out about Horace Stockwood. I think he had was answering a advertisement in the in the paper. Oh like, yeah. He had yeah. like Horace had placed like a, an ad saying he was looking for someone to fund the expedition because mm. because he really wants to get back there. Yeah. To really put closure, I think, around the events that had happened and and find some answers because he's been ostracized by the scientific community mm. for, for claiming that, you know, stones were moving and, and everything. Yeah, so maybe that's why the Doctor's intrigued. Yeah, no, that's true. So, uh, yeah, and so this is from Leela's point of view. So we get all manner of kind of odd stuff uh, here. <laughs> uh, so you get, get newspaper print, which she thinks of as kind of holy writing. And there's a kind of a, a wonderful bit where she's told to sit on the sofa. And so she doesn't know what it is. And so she says it would be disrespectful to do this in um, Horace's temple because uh, uh, she thinks of it as a temple rather than a house. And at this point, I have to just say that the, <laughs> the characterization of Leela, especially yes. in, in these this part of the, I was going to say these early chapters, but in, I guess in these even numbered chapters, mm. it's slightly problematic for me from a chronological perspective because would she really not recognize the concept of houses in London? Because she understands what, she knows what a hut is. She knows what yeah. a village is. It would seem to me like her reactions would have made more sense had she not already spent um, some time in London. Because yeah. this takes place after Talons, which is mm. 17 years in the future from the events of most of this book. And she's already been aboard the Sandcrawler in Robots of Death. I feel like this should take place like right after Face in terms of how new and fresh her reactions are to everything. Yeah, because there's no real reason why it shouldn't. Because, yeah, because, the, the, I mean, there is a reference to Talons, but it's it's fairly slight. Mm -hmm. There's also a line in this bit where um, she says that uh, she's a hunter and that she chooses a mate in her own time. And apparently that is supposed to explain why in the evasion of time, she kind of like falls in love so quickly with um, with with Andred or whatever his name is. Mm. Go figure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so one of the worst exits of a companion ever. And the doctor uh, sort of thinks that um, Stockwood is being kind of tortured by his past. And there's a brilliant line that says that the hunters are memories and we're here to rescue him. Uh, that there, there are some really wonderful kind of sort of phrases here that could almost be kind of like well, quotes in their own right. Yeah, so uh, Stock was kind of, as you say, trying to raise money for the expedition. And so the doctor gives him um, a kind of a, like a diamond to finance it. Uh, and yeah, I wonder whether it's it's a metabolist crystal. Is it something that, or metabolist? Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that he's got kind of kicking around in the temp, in the TARDIS. So, and uh, he seems to have a few of them. <laughs> so they pop up later in the book as well. I'm like, I don't remember the doctor giving out gemstones to everyone. <laughs> and uh, and it also seems that somebody's tried to break in to steal the tablet. And uh, Stockwood reckons they might have been let in by his servant because he knows that he can't afford kind of like proper salaries. The doctor kind of uh, goes off off to a pawnbroker to kind of go and uh, get rid of the um, the diamond or crystal and kind of get some cash. Uh, and that, that's where he gets his gold coins. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The next chapter is again in Leela's uh, point of view. Yeah. Another uh, 27 days have passed mm. on the ship. And the doctors get taught all of the sailors Octopus's Garden and various other Beatles songs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is so lovely and the great thing is of course Leela has no idea why they're singing about meter maids and stuff like that and she just kind of does it and they're kind of oh yeah well this is something that's going on the doctor also gets her to kind of wash uh, telling her that the uh, about the ritual of carbolic and that carbolic is the saint of hunters and we learn that uh, Leela likes to spend her spare time down in the hold with the pigs. Uh, mm. I don't want to say wallowing around down there, but it, it's, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, smell descriptions in this book. And and uh, oh, she's a hunter, right? Yeah. So she, yeah, she she's kind of it, it's stuff that she would notice. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. There's a cool scene where the doctor um, builds a bread oven for the ship out of spare parts. It's kind of a way to uh, ingratiate himself with the crew a little bit more. And also there's an implication here that, that Leela and the doctor had been imprisoned on the boat and they've recently been released. Starting to get the sense that uh, that there's been some bad stuff going down. And uh, there's also a lovely line because she, she encounters kind of like the cook who's kind of a friend. Uh, and the cook came from a place called Glasgow and apparently saw no reason to make an effort to be understood when he spoke. 
we get a lot of uh, dialogue written in uh, in particular accents in this. Yeah, we do, we do, and it's written regardless of who's narrating it in the accent, which again I I, I found slightly odd because I could understand with some of the narrators to come, but uh, like for Leela, I kind of like no, I don't think Leela would write phonetically. Mm-hmm. But yeah, hey hey, there's a crucial plot point in amongst all of this is that she overhears Royston uh, talking to a woman called Richards who she wants to kill for some as yet unspecified reason and uh, Royston is stuck with all his friends so Lila's confused as to really what's going on and uh, Richard's insisting that if Royston wants her help he has to denounce his friendship. Royston's really one of the only he's a scientist he has some medical training Mm. and he's really one of the only um, people that I don't know if he totally believes what Stockwood has told him you know all these Mm. years but he's certainly sympathetic to him and is along for the adventure and he's he's older as well i think they're both in their 50s or 60s at this point yeah that would make sense yeah uh and uh, and then the the chapter ends with leela deciding to do the ritual of carbolic on the quarter deck in front of all of the sailors <laughs> <laughs> that's leela for you we, we're back in london uh so kind of leela and stockwood are hanging out uh and uh, she thinks that he makes all his own shelves uh so uh you get a lovely bit of domestic stuff here uh, so uh, there is very reminiscent of talents um, because like, she she thinks that blue cheese could kill her uh, and she tries something called chocolate surprise um, which is too rich for her and makes her kind of like wretch when we wander off into London and uh, there's there's quite a bit of scenes of her just making odd observations yeah, specifically they go to um, the graveyard where Stockwood lays flowers on Alexander's grave which is a an empty tomb because the the body was never recovered from from the island. Yes, yeah, and this confuses her because uh, um, she she wonders why Stockwood needs to pretend that he's in the graveyard, uh, and also she wonders why no one has eaten the dead because uh, because uh, the seventeen apparently eat the corpses of uh, their loved ones. Yeah, we learn Leela and others are cannibals, which <laughs> yes was. Uh... I never knew that. Um, <laughs> yeah, we learned we learned quite a bit about Leela's background. That she had a an older sister that died before she was born, and mm. um, in some ways, this is always face of evil too, because there, yeah, that there are certainly quite a few bits where you're gonna go, yeah, yeah, that that's not been mentioned before <laughs> or since. So um, Stockwood um, sort of asks about why Leela and Doctor want to help him. And uh, she never really answers that because <laughs> she just kind of gets distracted with kind of weird London stuff. Uh, and when they go home for, for tea, they discover there's been a break in. Uh, and uh, the uh, it, it's OK because the doctor's there. And uh, it was it was Stockwood's butler trying to steal from him. And uh, the doctor fired him. Uh, which uh, when I first read it, I thought, like, "Oh, well, that sounds very sinister." Because uh, you know, the fourth Doctor, he you know, he does sometimes get a bit violent, uh, particularly kind of in, in the early years of the fourth Doctor. And uh, yeah, so the Doctor says they they all need to head off down to Portsmouth to um, to kind of catch a boat, and it will meet them in the in the George Hotel. And then kind of Royston rocks up, uh, who is very leery towards Leela. And sort of when Leela tells Royston that she's Stockwood's best friend, he says, uh, well, Horace, for a man who, roughly speaking, makes a friend every decade, your current choice seems about par for the course. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, Royston is nice. But, uh, and also Leela would like to see the animal from which you make chocolate surprise, because to kill it would be a challenge. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, the Ranga Ranga wasn't stolen at this point, right? It was an attempted right. break in. They still have possession of it, but that yes. could change. Yes. So then we cut back to the Tweed, which is the boat that has been sailing for for a long time. And I think the route they take is they go around the Cape. Is it Cape Horn in Africa? And they head across the Indian Ocean. Yes, it must be. Yeah, past Australia. They do go past Australia. Uh, Aussie listeners. Uh, yeah, Australia doesn't actually appear in this book, <laughs> but it just gets mentioned. So yeah, hey, yeah, um, and uh, also uh, the um, the captain tries to explain the concept of the globe to Leela, and uh, she doesn't understand why maps are flat if the world's a globe. And uh, the doctor says he tried to get Columbus to make a map using an orange and a biro. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, 
<laughs> that's fun. Uh, but also, uh, there's a little bit of a kind of yeah, another plot point is that she stumbles across Royston and Richards emerging from a cabin um, with kind of carrying some bloodstained bandages and smelling of sickness. And so she's wondering what's going on in them's their cabin. I, I, I did really like that moment about, you know, trying to teach Leela how the world is round and not flat and using the examples mm. of the um uh the masts you know on the curvature of the earth and you know, that was kind of a cool moment to see or to read so that brings us to our dramatic reading for the month mm. which uh is courtesy of myself <laughs> we'll uh have a listen i closed and locked the tardis doors the old thing sometimes gets nervous if I forget to secure the doors. I took several deep breaths just to prove the atmospheric monitoring subsystem wrong, and then in very short order wished I hadn't. I stopped breathing for a minute or two, long enough to analyze the rather pungent cocktail I had just inhaled. Fish. Birds. Oil. Smoke. Rotting vegetable matter. Rotting animal matter. Burning wood. Hot pitch. Manganese. Rats dogs. I concentrated. The fish were a day old. The birds were turn, recently arrived on their yearly migration. The oil needed changing. The smoke was derived from cannabis. The rotting vegetable matter was carrot. The animal matter was dead rat, being eaten by several more live rats. The pitch was cooling upon the hull of a nearby ship. The dog was old. A canny purebred turned to the wild, rather like myself I fancied. And the burning wood was laced with human sweat and with teak oil, normally used to seal the decking of a ship, all of which told me that somewhere nearby, a sailor had just thrown part of his lunch to a stray dog before grinding a strong toke out beneath his bare heel upon the deck of a ship recently arrived from the Indies, whose hull he was currently engaged in repairing. The manganese I had detected came, no doubt, from tiny nodules lodged within the damaged section of hull. The nodules definitely originated on the seabed and could only have been disturbed by a major storm. The fish go without saying, obviously. And the rats? Well, there are rats at docks in any century. Not all of them are animals. I compressed my sensory input to human normal. This is something I do from time to time. A little game which keeps me entertained and alert, and I stepped away from the TARDIS. The wooden dock creaked beneath my feet. Greasy water lapped at wooden supports. The sun was slipping away to westwards, leaving room in the sky for a wind. It was an interesting wind, the kind the French might refer to as tu rather than vu. No familiar summer phantom this, but a stranger of a breeze, a zephyr born in exotic latitudes, perhaps the offspring of some frightened hurricane or tornado, a wind of frightening and compelling potential, and one worthy of respect. It was a wind that Columbus and Darwin and Phineas Fogg would have understood. I smiled up at it and waggled my fingers through it and twirled my scarf happily at the thought that such an apparent simple thing could provoke such wonder. Oi! The voice was rough, and it was punctured by a flummy tobacco-related cough. What you doing here, then? Passengers ain't allowed here, are they? I turned. The dock handler was short, thick-set, with a brow that commanded attention as much for its obvious temporal proximity to his simian ancestors as for the thick mop of ginger hair that covered it. He wore the usual clothes one might expect of a dock worker. Rough, smelly, dark... He was walking towards me self-importantly, swaggering might be a better word. In one hand was a cargo manifest, in the other a hip flask from which I clearly detected the aroma of a rather dubious malt whiskey. I smiled. I was just admiring the wind. The man looked at me with an expression I had come to be quite familiar with in the last couple of centuries of dealing with humans. You can admire the boat from the other side of the harbor, or buy yourself a whiskey in the three tons on the I Street. That sounds rather splendid. Tell me, do they serve ginger beer? Ginger? What's that, then? Some foreign muck, is it? I checked my watch. Ah, yes, I was forgetting. It hasn't been discovered yet. The handler clearly lacked either the time or ability to be confused. Look, mate, it's easy. Move along or I'll dump you in the dock, and then you can move along. Only not so sweet-smelling if you take my meaning. Assuredly, I do, Mr... Just do as you're told before Mr. Harper takes it out on both our hides with a whaling harpoon. And Mr. Harper? He would be the captain of this fine clipper here, the Tweed, would he? No, that'd be Captain Stewart. Mr. Harper is the harbor master. He's much worse, so do your best in getting along like I said. I shall certainly take your advice. 
I started away from the dock handler with what I hoped he would consider a sprightly step. If you'd just be so kind as to direct me to his office? Actually, I didn't need to be directed. There was only one place the harbor master's office would be located in a port such as this. No, never mind, I added over the shoulder to the annoyed dock handler. I'll just follow the smell of corruption, shall I? So, as you could hear from that, uh, the point of view shifts, so we're now inside the doctor's head, and it uh, has him leaving the TARDIS uh, in Portsmouth Harbor. Uh, Mm -hmm. He took the the TARDIS to get down there. This is interesting, I think, because we rarely, if ever, get novels set from a first-person doctor perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think it was even a rule back at least in the virgin publishing days that you weren't able to uh being inside the doctor's head wasn't allowed because that would reveal too much of the mystery of the character yeah not only did they not allow first person narration i mean i think they very much tried to avoid even kind of showing sort of like his opinions or any more than was strictly necessary for the plot uh, and uh, yeah that rule is somewhat uh <laughs> the sequence and the observations it reminds me a lot of um like the beginning of the 11th hour where Mm. kind of see the doctor looking across the village square and kind of like hyper time like the technique that's used on sherlock Mm. he's observing everyone and seeing that rory's taking a picture with his cell phone but not at what everyone else is taking a picture of you kind of get that when he inhales the first breath of air as he's leaving the tardis and he's able to get this almost like mental map of his surroundings just from the textures and the sounds and the smells really in in the first nanosecond as he leaves the ship. Yeah, and I don't know if it really works for me. (laughs) I don't like to think of of the Doctor as being kind of like a superhero. Mm. Um, And it's almost kind of getting a little bit kind of super powers-y here. And and also, yeah, the Doctor, when we were talking about sense of smell, the Doctor decides to regulate his sense of smell down to human level just for the challenge of it. (laughs) I was like, oh, okay, well, that seems a strange thing to do. I mean, about Portsmouth, quite a bit of old Portsmouth still exists. Uh, so, like, HMS Victory, which is um, a ship that gets mentioned in here, and it's a ship that Nelson actually dies on, uh, and uh, that is still there. You can go and visit it. Hmm. And, uh, I mean, you know, Portsmouth has had development since then, but, there, you know, there is still quite a bit of the old town still remaining. Uh, and uh, there is a pub that features rather prominently in uh, later chapters, and that is a genuine pub. Oh, the, uh, huh. the three, three times I've been past it. Oh, that's cool. I I, I had yeah. no idea that those were real locations. Yeah. So yeah, a, a lot of the a lot of the, the Portsmouth stuff. Yeah, you you could go and try to recreate the walks. Uh, whether or not you, it would be any success, I don't know. I don't know Portsmouth that well, but uh, certainly there was yeah quite a few people like yeah 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 no that's there. So as we've kind of like alluded to previously, the um, the doctor basically buys the ship, the Tweed. Uh, and uh, he um, starts. He meets Captain Stewart and starts teaching his crew uh, a ticket to ride. Uh, <laughs> and whilst he's befriending the crew, the TARDIS gets loaded onto a ship bound for India, and that's the last we see of it. Yes, <laughs> in the book. Yeah, and uh, it, the book ends without them even uh, finding the TARDIS. And there's, uh, <laughs> I don't know if we'll we'll get to that at the time, but I I wonder yeah. if, if uh, maybe Jim Mortimer might have been setting himself up for a sequel or another book commission to uh, perhaps tell that portion of the story. Yeah, yeah, until uh, Chris Butcher came along and said, I'll write some novels instead. And everyone went, oh, you actually created Leela, so yeah, there you go. Um, But yeah, the Doctor feels that Earth is small enough that he'll run into it again, so he seems quite blasé about it. (laughs) He's not not entirely worried about it. He's being observed by a man with a ginger Mm. mop of hair uh, who is lurking suspiciously in the shadows and mm. he's going to show up again uh, later. He, he gets held captive at uh, gunpoint to kind of to end uh, end the chapter. We, we're quite good on the chapter ends, which I think you do need to have, if you've got this kind of weird structure where you're jumping back and forth, you do need to have kind of like memorable cliffhangers, even if those cliffhangers aren't necessarily addressed the next time that the um, that narrative thread picks up again. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we go back onto the Tweed Leela's now kind of 
trying to break into the cabin that uh, that Royston and uh, and Richards have been by, the sailors uh, start uh, talking about uh, a cyclone, and uh, she can kind of sense it, feeling it's like invisible monsters, and and she thinks it's it's a demon that she can kill. Uh, until the doctor says, uh, "Yeah, no, you can't do that." She describes lightning as being as being the demon cyclone throwing the sun into the sea. Mm. You know, we see this this terrific storm with these kind of huge waves, uh, and at one point they find themselves at the foot of a giant wave, and another ship right at the top of it. And you just get her sense of awe and fear, and uh, you also see how it's kind of like in, it's almost like reinforcing her kind of her belief structure. Mm. as well it's, it's it's interesting it's the first of several uh events that the ship kind of encounters along the way um so the first one here is a major storm and it's leela's first time experiencing it at sea so mm. but it's not the uh last of their troubles on their on their journey but it's <laughs> kind of the first big one um, yeah and she doesn't uh she doesn't tie herself to the mast either so there's that extra tension of her kind of wandering around the ship or you know clinging to things trying not to get flung off um mm. and then it, yeah it kind of ends on a cliffhanger with waves crashing over the ship and mm-hmm. then and then we cut back Leela waking up and this is back um back in London yep before yeah. they left yeah so um she's waking up in a room that's been given to her by Sotwood that's bigger than her family's hut and she's just basically being freaked out by the city uh, as like especially all of the metal that she sees because uh, she thinks kind of metal means things are holy she's basically she, she's experiencing culture shock I mean, mm. it's a place she doesn't understand even though as we say before she's seen it in towns so and she prays for the moon to brighten away the darkness and at this point she sees light dancing in the in the garden and uh, she believes it to be uh, her god cryuni the deaf spirit who must be hunting Stockwood because he's 50 summers old. She hears something downstairs and kind of goes and investigates. Uh, and uh, she sees footprints, and but knows that spirits don't leave footprints. So she thinks that uh, Cryuni has sent a human to steal the tablet. Uh, so, yeah, basically there's a burglary situation here, and Leela is describing it in the oddest way possible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, she, and she comes across uh, Royston, who she's thinking is uh, the burglar, but he's adamant that, you know, he's innocent and that he was also looking for the burglar. And uh, he's conveniently shot uh, the burglar, who was the butler from earlier. But Leela thinks that she heard Royston conspiring with the butler. There's, there's an interesting bit here where Royston wants to call the police, knowing that it's going to put a halt to the expedition. And uh, Stockwood decides to bury the butler in the garden instead, because <laughs> he just wants to just go ahead and just have the expedition. Yeah, and Leela thinks that because the butler's um, a big chap, that uh, burying him will bring in many crops. Leela says, uh, you know, we, we could bury him or you, or you could eat him. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and uh he, she's asked you know oh your tribe eats they're dead and she says only our friends and family the honored among us yes well because <laughs> she says it's um because they don't eat their enemies what they do with their enemies is they feed them to their animals because it's bad to eat something that hates you mm. <laughs> uh, so you you can see how that makes a degree of sense uh but yeah yeah, yeah just yeah. It, it, so I, I do have to wonder though, like some of the, some of the, like I said again, the characterization of Leela, a lot of what comes through in this novel, you we don't get in uh, the TV series. So well, it's... maybe it's very noisy in her head. Yeah. <laughs> so when she's looking distracted, this is because she's going, oh, Cryuni. Uh, so, yes. yeah. uh, we then cut back. We jump forward a few months. Um, so it's after this the events of the storm on the ship. Yeah. And the storm had lasted three days Mm. um and they're kind of recovering from it and picking everything up but they're well off course uh and uh, they've found themselves near the antarctic uh they've lost most of their fresh drinking water um so they decide to sail close to an iceberg to chip off some ice so they've got something to drink uh when it melts which makes sense uh so whilst everyone's kind of chipping away um kind of getting ice cubes uh, Leela decides to try to break into the cabin again. As she's about to open the door, uh, Richards uh, sneaks upon her and uh, and kind of like shoots a warning shot. And uh, then, then kind of like Stockwood and the Doctor also rock up. And uh, and 
there's a little bit of a confrontation here and and then Leela um, uh, sort of decides that she's kind of had enough of this and shouting that she'll be with the pigs as those have yet to betray her. Mm. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a bit odd. Mm. Uh, and then there's very conveniently, like within a, bank, a couple of sentences, um, kind of like um, the iceberg kind of hits the ship. So everyone kind of runs off. And so she manages to break into the room anyway. Uh, there is a bit of that where you kind of, you know, you build up this tension eat, and, and then a situation looks like it's not going to happen and then just gets very quickly resolved. You're just like, oh, oh, okay. The ship does do a lot of convenient lurching when the, uh, <laughs> when the, when pl- the plot demands it. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it does. Uh, so Leo's managed to barge her way in and there's uh, a figure in there rises and tries to shoot her. And uh, she realizes that it's Stump. Mm. Who is Stump, you might say? Which is a very good question because Stump hasn't been named in the narrative yet, um, and uh, and she clearly wants to kill him. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's a choice of a non-linear narrative, folks. Should should we point out who Stump is or, um, or hold up? Well, he's never actually named in the bits in Portsmouth. Yeah, so I think we if we don't if we don't connect the two, we yeah. we, we might as well say yeah. now. I think maybe so. He's the he's the red-haired. Uh, guy who is following the doctor and is the person who shoots Leela as they're mm-hmm. leaving the, the the port so the, the the bit of metal that was dug out of Leela's shoulder from the first uh, the first chapter by the doctor or sorry not the doctor the uh, Royston the yeah the, the medical doctor uh, mm. so the person who had shot Leela has been on board this entire time kind of hidden away in this cabin uh, for stump I just imagine Cole Meany for some reason I pictured uh, Toby Jones oh Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, t- yeah. Toby Jones would have been good casting. Basically, they get into a bit of a scrap, uh, and uh, there's no, um, there's lots of ice around the ship by this point. Uh, sort of stump, uh, kind of jumps overboard onto the ice, and kind of like Leela pursues him, and he slips, and sort of basically breaks his leg. And so they're on the ice, there's fog everywhere, and uh, he's clearly kind of really seriously ill as well. And so uh, Leela leaves him to his death, and he's kind of shrieking after that he'll haunt her. And then the ice splits, and uh, she thinks that they've sailed into um, a cryonis lair. Uh, and the ship somehow manages to break free. And I've read that bit about five, well, maybe four or five times. I was like, no, I still don't quite figure out what happens in that bit. But anyway... I don't see how chipping away at a little bit of the ice would split a giant iceberg in half, but it is kind of a cool sequence to, you mm. know, Leela and Stump kind of scurrying along the iceberg and, and fighting each other and, mm-hmm. um, you know, Leela jumping back onto the onto the boat. It's kind of a, mm. it's a action sequence number two. <laughs> yes. <laughs> on, the, yeah. on the boat after the, the big storm. Yeah. But there's more to come. Yeah, there is, there is. Uh, so we go back to Portsmouth. Uh, and uh, Leela's investigating the uh, the doctor's disappearance, and so she's at the hotel, uh, and uh, she, <laughs> she notices there's a doorman there who's kind of showing a bit of attitude towards her, and she assumes it's because he recognises that she's a hunter, but it's quite clear to uh, to the reader <laughs> that he thinks she's a prostitute. Yeah, and so she's wandering around Portsmouth trying to find, amazed by the priests, because she thinks that everyone that has any metal is a priest. Uh, on them and she kind of does a bit of kind of like tracking uh, and uh, finds a a mint humbug which means that uh, that's that's the doctor's trail she gets a bit of information um, that the doctor might have gone off to the free tons pub and she's being followed by the redhead man so stump yeah. uh, and there's a brilliant scene in this marketplace um, she's kind of being overpowered by how many people there are there uh, and uh, this kind of like street kid runs past, uh, sort of with some with some kind of meat. And the redhead man realizes that she's got a knife on her. Um, starts shouting that uh, she's a cutthroat, uh, so like a pirate. And so this Bob forms and kind of captures her. And the redhead man is quite smug because uh, he because they've done his work for him. And the way the the chapters are structured too it's interesting and this isn't the it's the first time that this happens in the book but it's not the last where you get the death of a character and then in the in the immediate next chapter you get kind of another scene with them or or mm. a revelation about them or, or something that kind of ties it in and so even though the chapters are non-linear thematically they're the way they're sequenced there's 
there's interesting, and some of this might be coincidental, but I thought that there may have been some purpose there in terms of, of how they were placed. This book was published in 98. It was originally written a bit earlier than that. We'll go on to that later. I think that uh, Pulp Fiction probably has a little bit of a, um, a legacy here, the mm. Quentin Tarantino film. Um, uh, just because that does um, yeah, slight spoilers for a twenty odd year old movie, uh, that that does you know, a similar thing where you have kind of characters uh, sort of reappearing after you've seen them die, mm-hmm. and, and which leading to extra poignancy at some points. And we should mention too that the reason Leela's having to track the Doctor is because. Mm. He traveled to Portsmouth by TARDIS, and he didn't yeah. take her with him. So she had to travel down with Horace and all the supplies and stuff for the, you mm. know, as as he was gathering the stuff he needed for the expedition. So we're supposed to go back to the Tweed. Actually, we find ourselves we're kind of like Leela is dreaming about her dead sister, and, uh, and, and it's it's quite a vivid like nightmare she pictures herself as a sister and then in turn as her mother um sort of dealing with the aftermath of of her sister's death uh because the sister was killed by hoarder um with the kind of the some of the beasts from um uh, um from the face of evil whilst in her crib and so leela's mum is called neela which is bizarre Seems a bit strange to kind of give your give your child a rhyme name but then again people call their kids after themselves so you know who am I to judge? She's woken from her dream by a kind of a commotion taking place outside the ship, and she goes to the top side, and she discovers uh, an octopus in a deadly battle with a whale. Mm. And there's a bunch of sharks encircling them, and yeah. the ship's kind of pulling up alongside this fight that's going on. Yeah, and Royston basically regards it as a spectacle. So Nita gets into a conversation with him, and Royston says that the reason why he tried to save Stump is because he's a doctor. He has been trying to use Stump's health as a bargaining chip to um, try to kind of uh, uh, sort of either get Richard to turn back or for kind of things to be less fraught. Do we learn who Richard's is at this point? No. Okay. We're no, no. Up. That's still to come. Okay. Uh, but it is interesting that, you know, so Leela refers to everybody pretty much by their surnames, you know, and including kind of, including Richard's. Uh, yeah, so she, she kind of treats the, um, you know, the genders equally in, in, in that kind of regards. I mean, she, she is, I, I think that there's quite a bit of kind of Leela in, in the DNA of Xena Warrior Princess. Um, mm. Not not that I've ever written seen that much of that show but um, so we've also find out that stump was kind of like wounded deeply uh, by um, by the bullets causing an infection he was also dragged in the ship's wake for 10 hours and the reason why he was locked in the cabin was to actually protect him from leela so as soon as that's said um the whale hits the ship and leela and royston fall off the shark infested water because uh, that's what the narrative demands we get quite a cool action sequence whilst kind of leela fights off a couple of sharks uh, and uh, including one from underneath, they they kind of notice that the the ship's on the horizon, and they realize they've got to kind of get out of the water, be away from the sharks. And the best way to do that is to kind of get onto the whale. Uh, and uh, she also feels that uh, that they need to kind of kill uh, the octopus. <laughs> Uh, so we also get this sequence where, uh, yeah, where you have Leela fighting an octopus and stabbing in the eye. Mm-hmm. But th- there's also one other little thing that there's quite a, um, a a cool scene where sort of Royston earlier on in that conversation we were talking about saying that um, that sort of like you know we're we're not animals we're people we've got morals and duties and choices and uh, Leela says that kind of like the animal way is better you kill your enemies or your enemies kill you. Um, sort of life simple and we haven't even gotten to the uh the most i guess a word might be outlandish or <laughs> <laughs> you know that's just a good word yeah, yeah uh there's more to come so yeah. r- as of right now we leave leela and uh royston as, uh, riding this whale <laughs> off yes. into the and and leela's uh she's she almost has almost like superhuman powers it, it seems like when she's um fighting the the sharks and, and the and the octopus and oh she's a hunter yeah I mean, she's, she's a like... hunter but she's human she's not aquaman yeah so uh, yeah so um back to portsmouth uh we're now seeing it 
at things from Stockwood's point of view. Uh, so he's noticed that Leela's missing, and he's also trying to defend Royston, like all of the equipment that he's intending on bringing, because uh, he's saying he has to kind of cope with what could go wrong whilst they're out on Easter Island, and also for trading with the natives, which is nice. It is worth saying, Easter Island is incredibly isolated. It's it's a thousand miles to the nearest island or nearest other sort of settlement, which is Pitcairn Island, that uh, nowadays has only 50 people on it. I just have to totally question my geography education in the uh, American school system because <laughs> for the longest time I, th- I thought the Galapagos were in the South Pacific by Australia, and I had thought Easter Island was where kind of the Galapagos were closer to the coast of South America. I had no idea that Easter Island was so far remote and mm. off the coast. It really is almost as far out there as Hawaii, you know, just farther south. It's mm. it's really in the middle of the Pacific or the South Pacific. Yeah. It's in- incredibly remote. Yeah, it is. I mean, it also, I mean, it's, it's amazing that actually it got inhabited. Mm-hmm. Sort of people would have just had to have just kind of taken a bit of a punt, go off in a raft. Like, oh, here we are. I kind of went down a uh, a Wikipedia rabbit hole uh, mm. reading about the Rongo Rongo and mm. the <laughs> the history of the island and the uh, the Polynesian diaspora theory in terms of like how they populated. It's it's really fascinating. If, if yeah. uh, I suppose that was kind of one of the the purposes of Doctor Who, right, to tell historical or pseudo historical tales and and kind of spark that interest. So it uh, it did it did so here for me. So I mean, there's there's lots of people that sort of most of what they know about history is from Doctor Who. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Stockwood has this kind of hunch that the Doctor might be kind of uh, hanging out with dock hands and thinks, oh, it might be down in the Three Tons pub. So, so they kind of go there as, and this woman's boot is kind of chucked out a window and uh, so they burst in kind of expecting that it's Leela in a fight and uh, actually it's, uh, it's a prostitute fighting with a barman. <laughs> Kind of as as Stockwood leaves, he gets coshed by um, by Stump. When they, as they were kind of detailing all the different supplies that they were loading onto the ship, yeah, I didn't realize this, but it totally makes sense. They loaded three tons of dental casting plaster to take a a casting of one of the stones. Mm. And I've seen castings of the stones. Is it pronounced Maui Mau Maui? I'm not sure how the, I, I, yeah. the stones are pronounced. <laughs> but I've, I've seen castings life-size castings of those in museums before but i never thought to realize like oh yeah to do that you'd actually have to cart tons of this material all the way there to, mm. do, to do that and back when they did it was a uh, kind of a cool detail that I, I would think that like a a real expedition you know non-fictional expedition mm. would probably load similar supplies so i found that kind of interesting yeah because because uh, I, I, I went down a very similar easter island rabbit hole to you and uh, i discovered a, a a kind of a painting that was uh, done allegedly of the time of easter island's discovery or around about that kind of time it shows um um the kind of the maui and they look nothing like what you what everybody kind of knows them as, but that's possibly because you know maybe yeah you know, the artist, if they'd actually been there, was kind of was was going from memory or something um, way after the effect. It's it's interesting. I mean, certainly this book, if nothing else, is is well researched. Mm-hmm. So, or at least gives the feeling of that. So, so we have the ridiculous. Fight. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we now get to the ridiculous bit. Yes. Uh, so we, so after the fight in the tavern, we cut back Leela riding the whale. Yes, <laughs> and, and now and, we and now we get the intersection with uh, the movie Sharknado. Uh, yeah, yeah, because Leela is steering it using rope, because uh, the rope came from the boats. Uh, and I was like, how much boat wreckage was? There? <laughs> and so she's kind of got the way. Yeah, she's got the rope kind of in and around the way. Why am I trying to com- explain it? It's bizarre. Um, I mean, it's. <laughs> Your belief just gets stretched. She's steering this uh, whale, yeah. um, <laughs> and they are catching up with the boat a little bit, or they're at least headed in the general direction. Yeah, well, they're headed in the direction, but also, I mean, I don't really know how good she is at navigation, but she's a hunter, so yeah. The whale is is dying from the uh, attack it suffered from the from the mm. octopus, so it's unable to. Uh, dive yeah. yeah so it has to stay near the surface because it's not able to i guess yeah. its lungs are punctured or something where it's not able to breathe very well so in the distance they see a shape and they think at first it's a ship but no it's a tornado 
Uh, and so you've got fish falling from the sky, which is kind of cool. And then Lena decides that she's going to recreate Jonah and the whale. And uh, so she and Royston climb into the whale's mouth as it's picked up by a tornado. Yeah. <laughs> I, the whale is near death or has died at this point, so it's it's yeah. very much like, yeah, Joan and the whale are climbing inside a tauntaun or yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, and then the, like the water spout sucks them up into the air and <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, well, uh, it's bizarre. Yeah, it's 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 it, instead of jumping the shark, you're uh... <laughs> you're riding the whale. Yeah, yes. <laughs> or yeah, instead of nuking the fridge, you're inside the whale. Yeah. So um, away from that insanity uh, we'll go back to, to Portsmouth uh, Leela the Doctor Stockwood and Royston they're all tied to posts in a tidal tunnel and uh, so the Doctor tries to use a Houdini trick but only manages to free one arm and uh, Leela uses a technique from the web spinner trees uh, from Face of Evil yeah I don't remember her ever really encountering those in, in the TV thing but anyway she, she basically yeah she, she, she has a technique and uh, she manages to do it so the Doctor and Leela uh, kind of head off uh, back to uh, the pub through a kind of like a secret door in a pier that for some reason the doctor kind of thinks might be there. Yeah, it, it gets very Goonies for a second, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, and they kind of break in uh, once the doctor... And there's quite a cool scene where the doctor brings out a whole host of keys uh, <laughs> that he has. He's got this, obviously, this enormous key ring. That he's quite pleased that they're from the time before kind of like double water slots. Uh, were invented uh, and uh, so they're able to kind of get into the cellar and Stump is there and there's a big old fight chased down to the pier and uh, Stump has kind of like got the upper hand on them uh, and then suddenly the police arrive I'm not quite sure if the police were actually uh, yeah no the police were a thing by this point yeah I think they were responding to gunshots yeah no but what I mean is the concept of the police Oh, because that that is a more modern thing than people think. Um, but yeah, so the police respond to kind of gunshots. Uh, Stump jumps into the water amid a volley of pistol fire and obviously gets hit. And uh, it's like the doctor kind of boards the Tweed, but they find that it's been hijacked by a cloaked figure uh, as well. During all of this, um, the doctor kind of says because um, like Lena's. You know, rattling off about Cryuni, uh, and uh, the doctor says that Cryuni is a construct and not a real god, and that Cryuni is from cyrogenic suspension. Mm. She be regarded as a giver of life, not a taker of it. And this is where Leela gets shot. Yeah, her wound in her shoulder from the opening of the book. Mm. We finally, now that we're almost done with part one, yes, <laughs> uh, of the book, it kind of dovetails back into the opening of the book because this is how she gets her wound and the bullet that gets removed yeah, yeah. and also as, as i said before stump is not named in, in any of these sports scenes so how does Leela know the name but it kind of helps rather than her saying oh it's the redhead man because that would give the game away as the boat's departing stump is you know hanging on to it by a rope and that's how he gets dragged in the wake poor stump uh, anyway <laughs> <laughs> we know go into part two uh, and we we start off with a very odd chapter mm. where kind of like Leela is basically reminiscing about the um is it the Zolst wind and kind of like getting lost in her youth and it, it's basically yeah it's just her reminiscing about kind of like the wind in um sort of in in the forest and how damaging it could be it doesn't really tie into anything it's an interesting kind of transition between the two halves of the book. Part one of the book is really the first two thirds of the book. It's yeah. not cleanly divided, but yeah. chapter 15 is kind of an interesting transition because Leela's visions that she's experiencing in the vortex, mm. if we were to kind of follow on from the narrative before the other, every other chapter thing, you might think that she's inside the whale and experiencing these mm hallucinations is part of the sharknado but mm. uh it's not it's her transitions that happen later on later on yeah so it's yeah. it's kind of an interesting bridge in in that it connects the two halves of the book through a little bit of kind of misdirection we're finally kind of arriving on on easter island we're going to have some of these chapters from now on in are going to be on easter island and some of these will be elsewhere <laughs> yes <laughs> We're seeing this from Stockwood's point of view, and we get confirmation at this point that Richards is the sister of Alexander. And yeah. uh, she actually 
speaks to Stockwood for the first time in the journey. And uh, she tells him that she wants to kill him as much as some people desire perfume, uh, which is nice. <laughs> so they, they kind of disembark and they see some of the um, the, the, the stone uh, Maui. And uh, the doctor uses a molecular analyzer and uh, confirms they're not ogre. So this is not like a pre-sequel to, um, uh, the, um, to the Stones of Blood. It is cool that we get that reference, and I know mm. Stones of Blood takes place later in the Doctor's timeline, you know, after mm. Leela's left, but it would, it would make sense that he has some knowledge of these stone creatures, the Ogri. Mm. And I also kind of wonder, like, maybe this is yet to be written, but I wonder if the Ogri and the Weeping Angels are somehow related mm. in terms of, like, living stone. That might be a... Yeah, that makes sense. Doctor notices that the, um, that the Maui's mass is fluctuating, uh, which uh, sort of becomes a little bit important later. Uh, and he also comes out with a wonderful quote from uh, Tor Heyerdahl. Uh, have you ever heard of Tor Heyerdahl? Uh, I have not, no. So he, he's a real person who was this Norwegian adventurer who shortly after the Second World War decided um, um, that it would be a jolly nice idea to um, to kind of sail off uh, on a kind of on a raft in the same way that people thought the Polynesian people might have done to kind of test the theory of whether those things were actually properly seaworthy. Huh. And he survived. So yeah, they were. And so he, he, he did a lot of adventuring like that and just sort of went to Easter Island. And uh, there's a quote from him saying that uh, upon arriving at Easter Island, it was as though we'd anchored off a hovering spaceship off the shore of an extinct world. And also Tor Heyerdahl, um, when he was really quite elderly uh, in the 90s, recreated some of these voyages for TV. Uh, and I remember watching it. Go down a rabbit hole about Tor Heyerdahl. He was an amazing man. Was a really quite an eccentric character. Uh, and he was just rocked up in all manner of different places. Uh, so he would also go to Azerbaijan. I mean, he probably one of the great adventurers of the second half of the 20th century. Oh, that's really cool. No, I hadn't heard of him. I mean, I don't know whether any of his TV stuff's on YouTube and how well it's aged, but yeah. I was a bit obsessed about Nyan when I was, when, when I was young. So uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, we, we also have some, some nice quotes as well. Where, but the, the Doctor basically does a lot of kind of showboating. And there's a nice sequence where it, there's, there's, we have this line of saying, hope is a good breakfast, uh, and there's this but a bad supper, <laughs> which I quite like. And uh, the Doctor seems to be very confident that Leader and Royston are dead, but Stockwood undercuts this in the narration because uh, he, tells, he tells us that actually the Doctor spent two days trying to persuade the captain to turn around and search for them. Mm. And uh, and they were kind of stopped with then also starts reminiscing about their first landing. They were kind of like greeted by the mayor uh, of of the island uh, and uh, and they kind of signed them to Toro as a guide. And for some reason, <laughs> they, everyone seemed to be able to understand each other fairly well. And then when they started investigating the Maui, uh, Tortoro's uh, child falls ill. Basically, we get to the events where uh, they find the uh, the Rongo Rongo tablets, having gone to this holy place that Tontoro really didn't want them to go to, and and that's how the events happen where you get the prologue, mm-hmm. uh, and then the flashback ends because there's some cannon fire, and then suddenly some Peruvian sailors rock up and shoot the doctor. Yeah, they <laughs> shoot him in the kind of near the right heart. Yeah, and he and he collapses, and there's there's a I think you mentioned it earlier, but. The doctor seems to be aware that Leela's still alive from the the shark, whale, octopus thing, but <laughs> it's not really clear how he knows that. He just mentions that her heart still beats, like he's able to sense it somehow. Yeah, I, I just thought it was just hope. Mm. But, uh, and, and the fact that uh, where he says, yeah, there's stuff about kind of like the gods um, favoring the young because they because they kill them, and this is well, where Leela comes from. The gods are real, and they don't favor her. Mm. It could be that he knows somehow, but I, I I just kind of got the feeling that it was just it was just his kind of gut instinct, mm. um, which could have led to a kind of like a bit of irony if um, if the original um, twist for the Sunmakers went ahead, because uh, that was because originally in that story Leela was going to die. Oh, I don't I don't think I knew that. Oh, okay, oh. yeah. Uh, yeah, there, there is a specific scene that was filmed that wasn't filmed of her death, but um, but yeah, where they'd have to kind of change the script a bit. But uh, yeah, um, she's kind of trapped in the machine. That anyway, we digress. 
we find ourselves um, kind of like on another world, like Leela's woken by Stockwood. So we're kind of further on in the story. And Royston's nearby and he's been unconscious as he was before the sun ate them. <laughs> um, and he's also been stabbed by a pirate. This is quite a, yeah, you get lots of information being thrown at you. You're just going to go, oh, OK, right. We're, we're obviously a lot further on here and there's some weird stuff. And uh, they're in a strange world of kind of like abandoned huts and they realise that they're in the crater of a volcano and they kind of climb up and uh, they discover that uh, the volcano crater is surrounded by a city larger than London. Mm -hmm. And there's two huge moons and a dark, sullen sky. They're not in Kansas anymore. And the city, I think they even describe it as eventually they, they say it's larger than the distance they travelled from London to easter island which is which is just a huge huge yeah. huge city and it's um completely abandoned there's just there's no life anywhere yeah i don't know if it's implied here or not but traveling they got there through some sort of gateway or bridge and and there's an implication that traveling through that bridge helps heal them so mm. i'm wondering if all the wounds from all the gun action that's going on throughout this book some of it gets cleared up by traveling to and, and from using the system that we're kind of learning more about yeah so we go back to easter island uh sot was hiding in a in like a cliff face uh and he uh, after Docs has been shot, and he finds a tunnel that's kind of part of the network that Tortoro had originally shown him uh, on his first time on the island. And uh, he um, stumbles across some of the islanders who are hiding in there, and they mistake him for a Peruvian who so speaks a bit of local language. And uh, then Jennifer Richards, uh, to give her her full name, uh, for the first time in the book, <laughs> rocks up. And sort of Richards reckons that um, they're slavers, uh, these Peruvians, and uh, they also realise that the pirates have captured a doctor. And they find out that the pirates arrived back three days earlier. And basically they tricked the islands into signing a slave contract. And, uh, and there's been a war between the islanders and the pirates, and 700 people have died. And a lot of the islanders are taking refuge in this mm. cave system under the island, which is left over from, um, it's really like lava flow tubes mm. that have hardened that they're able to, it's like a kind of a vast network of, um, which I guess is really a thing on the island. They have this this whole like lava tube system that you can, mm. it's big enough to like stand and walk through. It's also probably worth saying, uh, the Peruvian slavers right in the island, that was a real thing. Yes. Uh, and uh, they did decimate the population. Uh, it actually happened a decade earlier in real life than is depicted in the novel. But uh, but yeah, it really did happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as as odd as it might seem. Because uh, like Easter Island, it's part of Chile now, um, rather, rather than Peru. Uh, it's, a, yeah, it's a really long way for them to go to, um, um, to kind of, to, to capture slaves but, you know. and speaking of jennifer richards is this the point where we learn that she has a hidden knife on her that she's been hiding the entire length of the book it's kind of <laughs> chekhov's knife if you will yes yeah, yeah possibly possibly yeah. yeah we now go back to the other world i think that's probably the best way to describe this mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but um they've realized that kind of royston's kind of gone uh, because and they they kind of track his trail to Stockwood and Leela um, uh, to a monolith that upon touch turns into like a three-dimensional window showing stars and vegetation. And they go through that into kind of a place of different gravity. And so they go through a whole series of these mm -hmm. um, uh, until they kind of, they find Royston. So basically they are traveling between various different worlds. It's like a network of gateways. Um, the the way it was described was really cool. So you've got the outline of the statue head, but you can you step through it. So you you've got the shape of um, the Maui. Uh, so if it's night out, you'll get this like brilliant, like glowing. It looks like a statue, but it's really just the daylight you're seeing in that in that other dimension before you step through the the gateway. Or in a bright sunlit planet you'll you'll get the outline of it but it looks kind of obsidian and dark and you walk through it into the the nighttime of the um fortunately all these planets are uh class m or, or breathable <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah as they're wandering through yeah they're also all devoid of life yes 
they they find Royston, and then there's a monolith there that kind of causes Stockwood and Leela to experience the extinction of a civilization. And Royston also shows them this kind of like a history chamber thing that reveals that one of the worlds that they've been to was a moon that all of the monolith kind of material came from. The Doctor uh, appears, uh, carrying Richard soaked in blood, and suggests that he knows what this all means, uh, which would be useful. <laughs> I'm jumping ahead here, but yeah. that's kind of how the book ends. So it, mm. so that yeah. the the doctor appearing with with uh, Richards kind of in his arms, ready mm. to 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 try and save her. We'll we'll get to that in in that's <laughs> that's one of those dovetail moments that we yeah. that we saw in the first half. Yeah, um, and then we so we jump back to Earth, and this is uh, now from the point of view of the doctor. Again, yeah, right? it is. Yeah, the only other chapter from his perspective. Yeah, so I mean, Doctor's heart's healing due to double redundancy, and uh, and he starts kind of meditating, and uh, and we get references to the abominable snowman. Yeah, because he had he had been shot in the yes. previous cliffhanger yeah. two chapters yeah. ago. So yeah, yes. he's he's putting himself into a trance that, mm. as you mentioned, he had learned in Tibet from uh, the abominable snowman. Uh, story. He tells um, all of the islanders that are in the hold of him that uh, he, yeah, he's got a plan and uh, they think he's the devil and try to kill him. <laughs> Peruvians kind of um, come in and they take him to meet um, the uh, the pirate captain, De Bryce. He, he calls him Man of the Cloth, so I kind of assume that he takes mistakes him for a missionary. Mm, mm-hmm. they, they have a kind of like a bit of an exchange of barbs and the doctor says that Peru is going to force De Bryce to uh, return to slaves, but that will mean introduction of smallpox and destruction of the culture, uh, which is what actually happens, sadly, in real life. Mm-hmm. So the doctor tries to bribe him with diamonds um, to kind of like change his course, and De Bryce just takes him off him because he's that kind of guy. Mm-hmm. De Bryce says that um, he can kind of like convert valueless human life into precious stones by kind of just getting the um, his slaves just to work in yeah in the mines and stuff in Peru. Yeah, you get the uh, explanation of, or at least his perspective, like the whole slaver mentality, and it's really kind of sickening to uh, see it yeah. broken down into those kind of dollars and those terms. And yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We then the next chapter is relatively short, and that's from mm. Jennifer Richards' point of view, and that's yeah. where we get the reference to uh, Chekhov's knife and uh, <laughs> her desire to kill Horace Stockwood still. Yeah, and she this is so kind of from from her perspective of being carried mm. by the doctor through the the gateway, um, which has healed her wounds too because mm. she's. We'll we'll get to that in a second, but she yeah. she she gets uh, shot as well. The implication mm. is, uh, you know, as the doctor takes her through, and then we jump back to the cave under the island um, earlier, and we've got Stockwood um, kind of you know, waiting in the cave of Richards and uh, and and the Islanders, and uh, so the Islanders then kind of like take them in um, through like a network of tunnels until they find the Council of War. It's being led by Leela. Uh, who has um, survived the whole kind of you know whale thing? We don't we don't ever see that resolution. We get it, which is fine, I think, because <laughs> it was <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, the setup was was, but they survived and they were rescued by a group of Polynesians who weren't part of this island, but knew enough to to know how to get them there and so Leela and uh Royston have been having their own adventures for for quite some time. Yeah. I mean bearing in mind that the as I say the nearest island is over a thousand miles away. <laughs> but anyway, it, it doesn't matter. They're, yeah. Yeah, they're there. But some of the older inhabitants are starting to recognize uh, Stockwood and uh, this uh, old woman uh, says that Stockwood killed her brother. And uh, he tries to argue that he at least saved um, uh, her brother's son, Uh, but apparently the Peruvians killed him. And then they bring out this old guy who has been kept down in the caves for years and his skin was described as parchment. It was so pale. And it turns out that this was Alexander Richards, who (laughs) they had left for dead, but now was, you know, 30 years on. And they had been keeping him prisoner just for this moment. Kind of the old woman on the island was, seems like a spiritual leader. Um, Mm. Her name's Atani, turns and says to Horace, uh, stock which he says this is your punishment and mm. then kill 
Alexander Richards in front of Stockwood and his sister, Jennifer mm. Richards, and everyone else, basically describe it in very stark terms as, as you know, this we've been saving this punishment for you all this time. Yeah, it's quite grim. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we now go back onto the other worlds, and we have this odd chapter that's basically kind of like, it's told from Royston's point of view, but we see a chorus of thoughts from, amongst others, like Leela, Royston, Stockwood, Doctor, and Richards. Yeah. I, I don't think there's really much to sort of say about that. But it's, yeah, it's... it gives you hints as to what was going on in terms yes. of how why the statues were set up, but the Doctor explains it more clearly later on, but you get yeah. kind of hints of what, what's happening. Yeah. Then we jump back to the island. Yeah, so the islanders, they're washing Stockwood and Alex's blood. Uh, so Leela thinks they're welcoming into their tribe, so she just leaves them to it, uh, <laughs> and uh, goes off with some of the islanders leading an attack on the Peruvians. Basically, it now turns into, if you've ever played Assassin's Creed, particularly the pirate one, <laughs> there's a whole series of battles on kind of like a, on, on pirate ships, um, which is quite cool. Uh, kind of like sneaking around. And uh, so they manage to liberate the Tweed and uh, they then swim to the leading Peruvian ship. And uh, Leela sees that the doctor's there, chained to a cannon casing on a plank. Uh, and there's pirates that are betting on how long it'll take for the doctor to die. Just as she's trying to think of a way to kind of rescue him, suddenly there's some cannon fire and just all hell breaks loose. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, and you get this kind of sequence where Leela realizes she can't cut the doctor's chains. She, she needs to kind of go and get the keys off um, uh, Debrassi, the, um, the pirate captain. Royston kills a pirate to save Leela and thus proving that he's a good man, uh, but then ends up being kind of stabbed by a dagger. Leela manages to kind of get the key uh, and rescue the doctor, but the doctor kind of like falls into the water and she grabs Royston and pulls him to safety because the ship's ablaze and they jump to the sea just as the um, the ship explodes because of the magazine. Um, I mean, it's a brilliant sequence. I mean, I have not done justice to it, but it's just, yeah. Yeah, this, this whole sequence really is, I feel like, the climax of the book where you have mm. Leela kind of stealth slaughtering pirates and leading a slave revolt. And mm. it's just, a, it's a really cool sequence. Mm. And, and the doctor walking the plank and it's just... Uh, mm. Yeah, it was yeah. one of my favorites in the in the book. It, it's yeah, fabulous stuff. And so yeah, it ends with the Doctor, Leela, and Royston all in the water, and then mm. it jumps to uh, back to this off-world planet where the mm. Doctor and Leela and Royston and Jennifer Richards and Stockwood are all listening to the Doctor explain what happened mm. um, and why this civilization really it built these. Um, different statues and and sent them out through space um i guess looking for civilizations that they could influence and bring back dna their race were under attack like kind of krypton sends out some um a baby (laughs) and a cousin uh in in this uh, they've launched their dna uh, into space and the dna kind of attaches itself to various kind of hosts and so um, Easter Island is just one of many places where the um, the DNA landed. And the stones act as portals to all these different worlds where these probes they sent out with the with the DNA yeah. make, make contact. And it kind of subconsciously influenced the natives on this island, the native population, to um, build these stones. You know, this, this religion developed around it, and uh, it was so ingrained in them that it caused them to really deforest their island and and create all sorts of i wouldn't call it climate change but certainly local to the island in terms of mm. the flora and fauna that that grow on it. it it led to like almost all the the trees being gone because that's how they would yeah. would move these stones from the the kind of the quarry pit where they excavated them to their their mm. positions mm. i don't know that it explains why the stones come alive though yeah but, uh, nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and the doctor uh, hypothesized that some apparently this civilization brings people back to kind of help recreate their race and they do that from time to time and that some returnees brought back a virus hence all of you know the fact that all of these worlds that have been visited have been dead uh, and the computer records show those returnees came from earth 30 years ago so it was Stockwood's original crew have brought a virus that have killed all these other worlds, and the virus is still present. The implication is that it's smallpox, right? Yeah. Be- because that's the son who was healed, you know, 30 years 
prior in the prologue through, you know, traveling through the gateway. Um, hmm. That was the most recent time the gateway had been used because the Rango Rango is that tablet is the activating instructions for the gateway. Hmm. So without that, in what they call an incantation, without speaking those words, they can't um, activate the portal. They didn't have a copy of it on them, but they had like a, I guess like a rubbing of it, like a... Yeah. The doctor notices that the sun's starting to go out. Hmm. Um, so there's some sort of failsafe that mm. uh, is going to de- destroy the entire um, network of of portals because yeah. the, the creators who are unnamed uh, they don't they don't get a name in this but mm. they kind of design this framework so that if something were to come through and, and use it for bad purposes they'd, they'd have this failsafe to de- kind of self destruct the the network and the doctors I think hoping that. If they can get everyone back through the portal that mm. doesn't have, because because the the failsafe isn't activated when one of the native Easter Islanders goes through, because they have the host DNA as part of mm. their their makeup. Mm. But um, so they're hoping if they can go back through, that'll deactivate the failsafe. And they recognize that of everyone who's um, with them, Leela, her blood is probably what they would need to to manufacture an antidote to the to the virus because she comes from the far future. Yeah, and because her ancestors would have had some kind of like antibody, it was basically space science. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, and also around about this point as well. Royston um, realizes that kind of Stockwood has kind of gone off, and so has Richards. And uh, he hears a scream, and he finds that Richards has stabbed Stockwood, uh, and then she's killed herself. Mm. Which raises the question: How does Richards narrate if she's dead? But you know, hey ho. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's another reason for them to kind of go back because they think you know, if they travel back, that will heal Stockwood. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, they start their journey back to Rapa Nui or Easter Island. Uh, on Easter Island, we've, we've kind of gone back uh, a little bit. We have you know, Stockwood's kind of grieving for Alexander, as is Richards, and uh, they kind of she goes off on one, um, sort of saying that uh, a woman can never go off on an adventure, abandoning family and loved ones. So I kind of think, isn't that what she's done? Uh, and uh, then Leela, once she's finished invoking the priest Heisenberg, which is quite cool, uh, she uh, she tells Richards that if women in her land do not learn and travel and take control, then they're already dead. And also that uh, Alexander's death had actually given Richards life, you know, or his, his disappearance all that time ago. Mm. Yeah, we have all the voice-activated computer stuff that we were talking about. Mm. Uh, And because the translation is incomplete, only some of the people get transported across in that first wave. So, uh, which is why we don't see the Doctor and Richards. We just just see Stockwood and Royston and Leela. Yeah, why the Doctor and Richards show up later, which kind of, it dovetails to Mm. earlier when we were talking about that. And that's yeah. really where the the book ends. There's the epilogue after, but we also see um, that, that there there is another chapter where we. See... Oh yeah, the the confrontation. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. The doctor tries to get the the wrongo wrongo off Richards, uh, and uh, then um, the pirate captain appears, and it all kind of gets very Errol Flynn with uh, the doctor kind of uh, sort of uh, fighting um, the pirate captain with cutlasses on top of a cliff. And uh, Richards sort of basically offers the um, the captain all her gold if he kills the doctor, and he dismisses it because uh, like all of her gold's in England uh, or on the boat um, that he already has, and so uh, his men stab her, and so the doctor somehow kind of causes um, the captain to fall off the cliff, and and so one of the final bits of the chapter is that he insists the islanders take her to the caves. Every life is important. Every life. Um, which is kind of no, because like, this doctor doesn't feel very kind of traditionally doctory. It was quite a nice kind of touch, mm-hmm. and, and that that's where we see the end of of, of Richards. And then it ends with the epilogue uh, mm. thirty years later. So by this point, Stockwood's probably in his seventies or eighties, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, eighties sort of thought. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah sixty years after the prologue and mm. he had he had been living on the island for all this time. He never went back to England mm. and uh he's been working with the pop so the population in real life really dropped off you know from something like twenty eight thousand people to less than fifty or a hundred mm. people in the island in a in a really short period of time mm. and the book 
explains that by the islanders using the the gateways to travel back to those other worlds that are now yeah. empty and uh repopulate them mm. uh that way so kind of an interesting ending yeah yeah and and also he misses chocolate surprise mm. don't we all <laughs> uh, yeah the, yeah the, so so there ends the book so before we get onto the marks, so you're probably wondering because I, I I'd kind of suggested there was a specific reason why I wanted to do this book now, mm. and you might be wondering why that is. This book was not originally written for this Tardis crew. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> so this was originally going to be a Virgin New Adventure and was announced as such, and it was announced that during the story, one of the crew will be wounded by a cannon and that the next book it was dealing with the repercussions of the cannon wounding so what appears to be the case is this was going to be the seventh doctor's regeneration story oh ha huh. wow i had no idea so it was going to be apparently a temporary regeneration that was what they were thinking but they'd also felt that they told so many stories with the seventh doctor that they needed to have a break of sorts and then Virgin lost the license, so it became a... Also, the TV movie was announced. So, yeah, Hmm. Uh, this could have been up there with kind of like Logopolis and everything. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you you have just read the regeneration story that never was. Huh, that's (laughs) interesting. It kind of makes sense in terms of why it would be set up as like a two-part story because, you, Mm. you know, you don't have... The TARDIS doesn't get recovered at the end of it and there's a reference mm. to um marianne north and i had to look her up she's a i guess a famous british biologist and painter that they ended up traveling in in india with yeah maybe that factored in or huh this is going to be um a seventh doctor and benny chris and, uh, and ros as well yeah, i could see some of the more action sequences like the shark punching <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> with with chris and Roz. um maybe not so much with benny but Huh. Yeah, I mean, I've looked online. I've not seen any kind of confirmation of what, but certainly the Doctor Who magazine at the time, because I definitely remember noticing it and thinking, "Hang on, they're going to regenerate the Doctor. Surely that's what that means." This was announced in like '94, so hmm. uh, before the TV movie was a, was a thing. You certainly have a funereal atmosphere mm. throughout this book. It was you've got the kind of the specter of death, the cryuni mm. lurking in Leela's mind, and there's the, the author note at the end of the the book mm. where Jim Mortimer talks about how he wrote this around the same time that his uh, father passed away from a from a brain tumor. Mm. So I'm wondering if the process of writing this book and, and those events are, are somehow linked as well. Yeah. Yeah. Cause he also, he says that, um, that he hasn't suddenly got religion. Uh, and I kind of think reading the book, it's very, yeah, certainly religion is, is very much a theme, but also I, I kind of think the disproving of it is as much a theme as anything. Cause like most of the faiths that are encountered, you kind of, you are shown reasons why you know, they should not be. So there's a really wonderful scene. Um, it was, kind of a flashback to to face of evil in this mm. book where Leela's talking about how she in within her tribe she was seen as a heretic um for not really believing in all of the teachings of the seva team mm. but the doctor says your doubt and your skepticism around those ancient rituals are mm. that's what makes you human it's not the religious aspect that adds to the humanity but it's the um the working through that i thought that was kind of an interesting message yeah i, mean, I think it's, it's less a religious book than an atheist one Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah so 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 what did you make of it it was interesting i <laughs> the uh i was wondering if there was like a a reason why the story was told the way it was i'm wondering if is it a kind of an advanced literary technique to beef up a story like that or mm. are you adding a level of say artificial suspense because you're you're cutting to you're constantly cutting to new scenes without resolving previous cliffhangers, which kind of forces you to keep reading until all the plots catch up to each other. Hmm. It's an it's an interesting technique. I'm just curious what, what you thought as to whether it added to the story. Like, I almost, um, I made some allusions to this last month, but Leela's not my favorite companion. Um, yeah. I had almost considered going back and rereading this book in chronological order and i think Mm. had it not been so much leela first person point of view 
I might have gone back and, and tried to do that just to see. I don't mind, you know, stories where kind of the, the journey is the point and not the destinations, mm. right? Mm. Like a Lord of the Rings style mm. journey. But I, I wonder if reading it chronologically like that, if it would have felt like the plot would have been more tedious or drawn out. Because I, I think it's effective in, in mm. and I'm glad they did it that way. It's just um, mm. when I see that same sort of technique used on TV, say in shows like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or Alias or... Battlestar Galactica, where they show you the climax of the book and or the the show, and then mm. you know they cut back to two days earlier. Sometimes I question whether that's trying to cover up some other deficiency in the book or not. Yeah. I just, what what do you, what do you think? Yeah, I think I think part of it was it was maybe because it you you kind of question the events being presented in this order. Now, it, I I wonder whether it ties them thematically again into the question of faith. Because you you might start to piece stuff up in your mind as to what has what's happened. Uh, so particularly in the early scene where, where you yeah at the start of both parts uh, when you have the kind of like the thread that's sort of more advanced, you're kind of trying to figure it all out and sort of based on not that much evidence at that point. And so maybe it ties in. I mean I'm reaching a little bit here, but maybe it, it, it kind of you yourself are trying to kind of like put together the mythology mm. based on what you can see, even though you don't have complete knowledge. In a way, that's kind of like a detective or uh, like a mystery story, right? Where you're piecing together the clues. Yeah. So, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. But I mean, certainly, I mean, I imagine that the the bit sounds at sea. If that all been in one thing, that could have got a little bit tedious. I mean, it's it's a very interesting and sort of memorable. Read. I mean, there aren't that many Doctor Who novels like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the first person narration. I mean, I found to be quite effective. I enjoy Lee's character far more than you do. I, and I sort of found it also the kind of like the splitting between the various narrators quite effective as well because you had different styles. I mean, not so much between Stockwood and Royston. Those were maybe relatively similar, but then again, those are people of similar backgrounds. I and mean, certainly, when when it's the Doctor and when it's Leela, you can instantly tell. I thought at first, I was um, I, I, I was struggling to find time to actually kind of read it because it's something you do need to be able to put some time together to concentrate. It's not something you can read like twenty minutes or so before you fall asleep. Yeah. Yeah, um, it, is, it, it really is. A, it's, a, it's a book that kind of you know, that rewards concentration, I would say, but demands it as well. Yeah. And you have to chew on it a while, too, I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and be prepared to flick back a little bit and go, what just happened? Because mm-hmm. um, like, I mean, I skim read it today to kind of put my notes together. And there were a few things that kind of like fell into place that I hadn't quite spotted the first time. But I, yeah, I read it in the order in which it was written mm-hmm. <laughs> rather than jumping around. Yeah. So how would you uh, rate this one? So I think... <sighs> I think I'm going to give it an eight. I would love to give it a bit higher. I think it's got one or two little problems in it, but it, yeah, I really enjoyed this. Um, and I, mean, I think it would have been a bit higher if possibly I could feel that all the various narrators actually had opportunity to write it. Because <laughs> I mean, it could be entered in the Doctor's 500-year diary or however many years it is. But uh, yeah. Yeah, um, uh, that that that's my kind of feel. What 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 do you reckon? I think you'll go lower. Uh, yeah, but maybe not as low as you think. I'm giving it a seven. Ah. Yeah, I liked it. I I thought it was clever, and like you said, it demands and rewards concentration. That's I think that's mm. a really good way to to think about it. I thought that the shifting points of view and the shifting time structures were cool but mm. that one of them would have been enough <laughs> having both of them going at the same time just overcomplicated it for me a little bit in that respect i did like with the with that kind of non-linear storytelling it did make the narrative kind of feel like a dream mm. or like a travel log where you're hearing about a story from several different points of view and someone mm. you know chimes in like oh and remember this bit happened and that mm. bit happened so mm. I did. I did like that. Um, I felt the ending was a bit odd with Jennifer Richards, how she dies in one chapter and then the very next she's alive and the doctor's trying to save her. I get what Mortimer is trying to do there thematically, but it's such an abrupt ending. I'm glad the mm. ep- epilogue was there to kind of put things in perspective. Mm. I thought Jim Mortimer definitely captured the character of Leela really, mm. really well, um, because as I was reading through it, the same reasons I didn't like her. <laughs> <laughs> in, in the TV shows where we're present, so I'm, I'm thinking, yeah. you know, it's it's authentic in in that respect. It's um, <laughs> it's 
if if you love the character of Leela, you will love this yeah. book. I, I almost gave it an eight, but um, some of the things I pointed out earlier in terms of her characterization and how it seemed like Talons and Robots of Death never really happened, that dropped it a little bit for me, as did just the, the entire sequence with the, the sharks and the squids and the, <laughs> yeah. the the Sharknado. I mean, that's just too silly for for me. Even for, I can accept Forobisher more easily than I can um, all of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think if that hadn't happened, I'd have given it a nine. Mm. But yeah, I mean, the thing that you said about the various different narrators uh, and with their different various events makes me kind of think of the Gospels. Mm. Uh, so yeah, another kind of uh, religious uh, analogy. Mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah. So a, a seven and and an eight. That's that's pretty solid. That's a yeah yeah. yeah. I must say, I've not really heard much about this book. I mean, apart from kind of like what I knew about it possibly being a regeneration story at one point, and so. It, it seems to be, it doesn't seem to be talked about. I think it, it's one of the great books of the BBC range, I'd say. Um, I mean, it certainly is very memorable. Yeah. It's not kind of like Doctor Who by rote. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> by any yeah. stretch. Yeah, I, thought it was a, I thought it was a good pick. I'm, I'm glad I read it. Yeah, so am I. So am I. I don't know that I like Leela anymore, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was the first novel with her in that I've read. Because uh, mm. I think I said last time I'd read a, a Decalogue story that uh, just utterly failed to capture her. That was, yeah, I enjoyed it. Shall we talk about listener feedback? Yes, please. Yes. Listen. We don't have any emails this month. Oh. Yeah. But. Please write in, give tell us your thoughts. Uh, mm. We'd love to hear your thoughts on short trips from last mm. month, as well as if you've read this book, um, what you mm-hmm. thought of it and the the structure. Did you have any Facebook comments or posts to speak of? No, no, alas, no, no comments or posts. We've had a few likes, uh, so uh, please keep on liking and keep on listening. We did run a Twitter poll, mm-hmm. and we asked, uh, of the following four major Doctor Who book ranges and publishers, mm. what was your favorite? And the choices were uh, Target novelizations, Virgin publications, so new and missing adventures, mm-hmm. uh, BBC books, so Eighth and Past Doctor, Mm. or um, BBC Penguin, so the new series. Mm. Uh, The new series got zero votes, so that was interesting. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah. uh, (laughs) Not surprised. (laughs) The uh, Target novelizations and the BBC Past Doctor, Eighth Doctor books got uh, 25% each of the vote. Okay. And then with a uh, whopping 50%, the uh, Virgin New and Missing Adventures were chosen as the favorite. Yeah, that feels right. (laughs) um and the other kind of cool thing we did get mentioned on uh this week in time travel uh that podcast in response to their uh my doctor is question Mm. uh we answered bookish and (laughs) (laughs) and you can uh, hear that in podcast 23 on uh, Mm -hmm. this week in time travel yeah that's pretty cool yeah i was having my breakfast when i was sort of doing that i think i actually spat out coffee (laughs) (laughs) right yes yes yeah yeah you caused me to have to mop up after myself yeah cool cool so no no communications from any gentleman in lime green reading um the cyberman uh celeste mccoy story sadly not no 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 no, Um, so what are we doing next month so next month we are going to be doing something different and new again um Mm. But rather than do an anthology series, I thought, you know what? It's time we read a graphic novel or comic series. So Mm. I'm picking uh, Prisoners of Time Mm -hmm. was done by IDW, the last major thing they did before uh, Titan took over the comics license. And it was the uh, 2013 50th anniversary kind of 12 issue maxi event series, as we used to say back in the day. (laughs) And it was also one of the selections from our listener, uh, Thomas, a few months back, mm-hmm. too. So, yeah, this will be interesting. It's a, mm. I'm not sure quite how we're going to review it, because it's... Well, I mean, you can, you can review... You can review com- I, mean, I think doing a reading from it will be interesting. But, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I suspect there may be some speaky bits. 
I'm very much looking forward to it because uh, I do greatly enjoy Doctor Who comics uh, over the years. I've not read as much of you know, of the IW and uh, and Titan output. Um, I must confess, yeah, those that I have read, I have enjoyed. But I mean, certainly, kind of going back, I mean, I'm I'm one of these people of the opinion that certainly in the '80s, uh, the best six Doctor stories um, were uh, were in the comics. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah, not that, that took much doing. Yeah, I'm looking forward. Uh, so, is it by Tony Lee? Because he seemed to do pretty much. He, he seemed to do a lot of IDW stuff. Yeah, I'm not sure if he wrote all of it, or because I know no. each issue is with a different Doctor and TARDIS team, and they they kind of all come together at the end there. So, oh, okay. I'm not oh. sure how they how they did that. So we'll we'll find out. Yeah, yeah. So until next month, mm. I've been Matt in Minnesota. Chris and Savannah. Happy reading. Thank you for listening to the all new adventures of the doctor who book club podcast special thanks to george c music for use of their song doctor who theme swing jazz version you can follow us on twitter at a n d w b c podcast and like us on facebook you can support the show by leaving us a rating and review on itunes you can contact the show by emailing your thoughts to a n d w b c podcast at gmail.com and until next month happy reading We're having some shenanigans. I read most of this book waiting in line for four hours for a uh, SNES classic. <laughs> <laughs> so I was I was one of the uh, people reading a Doctor Who book in public this month. Right. Okay. <laughs> I, I did I did manage to get my SNES classic, which was good. Cool. I was at a at a comics convention uh, a few years ago, and uh, and Tony Lee had had some kind of uh, disagreement with the convention, and so he was doing his own breakaway convention in a pub just outside. <laughs> <laughs> and, kind of, and so uh, people were just kind of coming there and uh, decided just hanging out. He's lovely. Yeah, it was the London um, Super Comic Con or something. Uh, so we kind of had had Stan. Lee and uh, and Paul Cornell and uh, I was slightly more excited about sort of actually getting to meet and speak and uh, hang out with Paul Cornell than I was Stanley. <laughs> but uh, Tony Lee, no relation, was lovely. Cool, cool. Tomorrow I will go and see uh, Leela herself. Yes, which will be good fun. Then Peter Davison and and Colin. Tomorrow sings in a theatre, so uh, it's a versatile enough venue that next Friday they're doing wrestling. Oh. <laughs> Yes. A little fun. Local wrestling rather hmm. than sort of, you know. The WWE stuff, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I once shared an elevator ride with Louise Jameson, uh, <laughs> and I didn't didn't say anything to her at the, uh, I think that was at Chicago TARDIS one year. Okay. But I, I, I figured if, uh, if I uh, don't have anything nice to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think she's. I think she's lovely. I think she's lovely. Yeah. I just her character. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. She certainly has has come across well. But with Cartmel, it was just kind of I saved him from somebody who was trying to get him to explain the Cartmel master plan for like the <laughs> for more the zillionth time, and uh, and I could just sort of yeah, I could see him kind of like yeah, this is why I don't really do these things these days. I ran into Andrew Cartmel a couple of times at Gallifrey. He was a uh, early morning swim as was I so we would both mm. get up and use the pool and, and swim and, and do laps and stuff and then one time uh, Annette Badlin was there and I didn't ah. realize she was in the pool and then so like I turn around and behind me Margaret the Slovene kind of <laughs> rises slowly from the water <laughs> oh, <God>. yeah <laughs> I suspect there'll be a fair few easter eggs and stuff no pun intended that was a good one <laughs> Thank you.